hello everybody. Can I just say that I am just so honored and so excited for today. So happy that I have the privilege of sharing God's word with you guys. So without further ado, I'm just going to dive right into it. Let's get started. So the sermon for today is based out of John 21, 15 through 25, which says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that the disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Wow, that is such a good passage of scripture. So good. And the entire time that I was reading and studying and preparing for this sermon, I kept imagining Peter and just imagining myself sitting down at a table and asking him to unpack this entire passage. I wanted to know everything. I wanted to know how he was feeling at each point. How did you feel? feel when you first saw Jesus? How did you feel the first and second time that Jesus asked you? What was truly going on in your head when Jesus told you how you were going to die? How did you feel? But then I had one specific question that I really wanted answered. And if I were able to sit across a table from Peter right this very moment concerning this passage, the question that I would want most answered out of all of this is, Peter, what is he doing for you? Which leads me to the title of our sermon. That is the title. Peter, what is he doing for you? And while I was imagining this and looking through this passage up and down, sideways, backwards, everything, I came up with three things that I think Peter would say. The first one is that he restores. In verses 15 and 17, Jesus and Peter go back and forth. Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? Peter saying yes. And you know what the cool thing about that is? 
is Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Three times. Which has been linked by scholars as a way that Jesus was restoring Peter from his threefold denial in chapter 18. It's kind of like Jesus sees Peter and he's saying to him, who you were is not who you always are going to be. Like, I see you, I see what you did, and I know you messed up. I think you know you messed up too. But you know what? Now that we both are aware that you messed up, there's room for me to come in and help you. You don't have to stay where you used to be. You can come with me and you can be better than you were. You can be restored. And restored literally means to make whole again. Jesus is taking Peter who now has some worries and doubts about who he is, who he is with Jesus. And he's restoring him to fullness in Christ again. He's restoring him. The second thing I think Peter would say, if only he were here, is he calls. Looking again at verses 15 through 17, we see Jesus, after Peter says yes, every single time, to some extent, Jesus says, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. He says something to that extent about taking care of feeding sheep. And you know what? Jesus isn't saying that to Peter in a literal sense. He's not asking him to literally take care of some sheep that he owns. He's not doing that. It would be funny if he was, but that's not what he's doing. He's not like, oh, hey, I'm about to go head up to heaven with my father. Could you hold right here? Watch my sheep for me. Make sure they're all fed and nice and taken care of just until I get back. It might be a couple thousand years, whatever. It's no biggie. But could you watch them? Yeah? Cool. Thank you. I appreciate you. He's not doing that. Jesus, when he talks about sheep, is referring to his people. How do you take care of Jesus's people? That's the next question. What does it mean to feed them? You know, to feed Jesus' people means to make sure that they got this in them. Make sure that they got God's word in them. Feeding them the right things, which is God's word. Taking care of them means being a shepherd over them. It means to protect them from harm. It means that when they're going astray, you bring them back. When they're lost, you bring them back home. When they're hungry, you feed them. When you're thirsty, they, you give them water. You protect them, you help them, you nurture them. It's kind of cool because in the story above this one, in John 21, one through 14, Jesus, Jesus meets the disciples at the water while Peter is fishing. So Peter's a fisherman. He's a fisherman, guys. He changes his whole job description. He goes from fisherman to shepherd real quickly. But what's cool is I feel like with Jesus saying to Peter, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep, he's saying, I trust you to take care of my people. Despite what you've done, I trust you. I see where you can be. And the last thing that I think that Peter would say is he focuses. In verse 22, we just get done with Jesus telling Peter how he's going to die, right? He's gonna get crucified. 
that's what it means. He's going to have his arms stretched out wide and he's going to get crucified. Nobody wants to get crucified. I hear it's really horrible. I don't doubt it. The Romans are very good at torture. They're very good at it. Sad and sadly for the people who got tortured. But nobody wants that. It's not something like, oh, I hope I get crucified tomorrow. It's not like that. Obviously, nobody wants that. <laughs> but I feel like Peter has the only logical human response to being told how you're going to die and not even just how you're going to die, but such a gruesome death as well. It's super gruesome. Because he's literally just like, okay, um, this has been super fun. Getting told how I'm going to die and all this stuff. Let's keep the fun going. And let's go on to John. How does, how does John die? Let's keep the fun going. How does he die? Huh? Yeah, let's, 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 let's move on to somebody else now. And Jesus, in verse 22, he pretty much is like, whoop, hold up, pause. And he literally tells Peter, if I want John to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Jesus takes this as an opportunity to focus him on what's truly important. Is what going on with John important for Peter? No, it has nothing to do with Peter, what God has planned for John, how he's gonna die, anything about John doesn't really matter. It's just a fact. What's important is that Peter follows Jesus. He's making sure like, oh, you're going a little bit astray. You got to get back over here. He's being that good shepherd, like the Bible says that he is. In Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, it talks about how we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and run our race with perseverance. And you know... It's like Jesus is telling Peter, you don't have to worry about others. Keep your eyes on me. This section where Jesus is pretty much focusing Peter reminds me of running a marathon. Don't get me wrong. I have never once in my life run a marathon. Never once, probably never will. But I've heard stories from other people who have run marathons. And you know, one thing has always been a common theme with people who have run marathons, especially if they've done it more than once. The common thing that I've found is that they don't worry necessarily about getting first place. That's not their main goal, to get first place. In a marathon, most people's goal is to A, finish, get to the finish line, and B, beat their best time if they've done one before. And you know, you're not going to be able to run a marathon and get to the finish line if you're constantly worried about where everybody else is at around you. You look forward, you might get disheartened because you're so far back. You look to your side, I don't know about you, but when I just even walk and I walk and I look over to the side, I slow down because I could fall. And I don't need any help with that. I'm already clumsy enough as it is. But then it gets really bad if you keep looking back. If you look back, you slow down drastically. And it comes with even more risks. Because if you look back, you literally have no eye 
on where you're going. At that rate, you could probably be going woo, zigzag motion like you're trying to run away from an alligator. So, with a marathon, you don't focus on who, other people. And you know what? It takes so much preparation and hard work to be able to do a marathon. Which also ties into how Jesus calls us. You know, maybe there are some people right now who need restoration. And Jesus can do that. Jesus wants to do that. He wants to restore you, just like he did, Peter. For anybody out there today who might feel a little bit like Peter, who needs some restoration, I just want to tell you who you were is not who you always will be. I'm going to say it again. Who you were is not who you're always going to be. Did you get that? You're not always going to be there. Lean in and talk with Jesus. Get in there and talk with Jesus. Jesus sees your failures. He sees it. He also sees where you're headed. He also sees where you can be and wants to help you get there. You know, he calls you. He has a calling for you. He has something that he specifically wants you to do. He does. And you're never going to get there if you're worried about other people. He, he will help you focus, whether it's you listening to this message or any other thing. He can use literally anything to help focus you. Maybe you really needed this message. To be like, oh, hey, keep your head straight. Focus on Jesus. That is who I'm focused on. Keep your eyes straight. Don't be a swivel. Don't swivel your head. We're not worried about who's on the right or left, in front or back. We don't care. It's not important. What's important is keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. And so, I think maybe a better question, instead of Peter, what is he doing for you? Substitute your own name. For me, obviously, Haley, what is he doing for you? Just substitute your name. I want you to put your own name in there. And really just ask God, what are you doing for me? God, what are you doing for me? And I know that sounds really bad. Like, God, what are you doing for me? It could sound hopeless, but it doesn't have to be. When I think about that, God, what are you doing for me? I find that to be more of a reflective statement. Like, God, what are you doing for me? Wow, you've done X, Y, and Z. I am just in awe of you. And you know, the preparation and the training, it can sometimes feel so difficult. But just like with a marathon, it might be hard work, but I always hear that it's worth it in the long run. So I just really quickly wanna pray with you guys. So God, thank you so much for each and every person here today, Lord. I pray that you would just meet them where you where they are right now, Lord, and just let them know that you see them, you want to restore them, you have a purpose and a calling for them. Lord, just help them remember that today. Give them that reminder, Lord. Amen.